Welcome, everyone. I'm Sharon Spence Wilcox. I'm a librarian here at Seattle Central. And we are going to have the pleasure of hearing from Christina Taylor this afternoon. Um, but she's part of our conversations on social issues, which is an extension of the library's charge to promote freedom of information and openly exchange ideas. And the way I look at it, most librarians feel like there's going to be something in the library that's going to offend everybody. And there's, we want it like that because we want everybody to also be, avail, um, be, be able to see all the different perspectives that are out there and to learn. Okay? So this series is entitled Confronting the Myth that Slavery Ended with the 13th Amendment. Mass Imprisonment in the 21st Century. And Christina Taylor is Program Coordinator for International Education Programs. So please welcome her. Thanks for coming. Hopefully more people will trickle in you know, as we go along. So I will be talking uh, briefly about mass incarceration, mass imprisonment in the United States. And it is such a wide topic that there is no way I can actually do it too much justice. So if there's something that you know that I didn't cover at the end of it, feel free, you know, as we discuss to bring those issues up, okay? So, a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm Christina Mears Taylor. I have a master's degree in African American studies. And so my research, um, so I did my research on was on mass incarceration, and I um, focus on black women. Um, and so that's what my research is on. And um, this topic really touched me because, um, you know, I have family members who were in prison, um, friends who were in prison, some that are still in prison. Um, you know, I have colleagues of mine um, in my master's program, actually, whose family were um, victims of, of the COINTELPRO program. So that's that federal program in the 60s and 70s um, from the FBI that um, zeroed in on certain individuals and families that they deemed dangerous. Um, and so um, it's now been striking as illegal um, and have been rebuffed, but it was going on for a while. And so this is a topic that really touches me and I'm really connected to it. And so hopefully I can do it a little bit of justice today. Okay? All right. So, 13th Amendment. I believe that we have all been fed a lie that slavery ended and that it was abolished. Okay, this is the 13th Amendment, what it actually says. Um, that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, um, you know, uh, where a party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. So essentially, um, yes, yeah, slavery has been abolished, except if convicted of a crime. And so I, I, I feel like that is the under the table deal that was made. So we abolished slavery. However, you can still lock millions of people up for crime for crimes. Um, and so um, I wanted us to start there, um, to really look at this idea that slavery is ended. So, well, yes, how many legally enslaved people do we have in the United States today? So these are your options, 1.4 million, 1.8 million, 2.2 million, or 2.4 million. How many do you think we have in prison today? 1.4? We have 2.2 million prisoners today. Okay, over 1 million are incarcerated for nonviolent offenses. Okay, um, and nonviolent drug offenses account for one fourth of prisoners. So you know, break that breaking that down by race. Blacks who make up about thirteen percent of the U.S. population account for about thirty eight percent of the prison population. 
Um, Latinos, who make up about 17% of the U.S. population, account for 21% of the prison population. And whites, who account for 78% of the country's population, only make up 35% of the prison population. So how do we, how do, we do that? <laughs> how, do we, how do we get there? Um, well, you have 13% of the po U.S. population in prison more than the majority. Um, so I wanted to break that down for you guys so you actually can see the, the numbers, you know, all the faces that are behind that we just locked up and throw away the key. So, let's talk about the state of Washington. Now, comparably, Washington isn't as bad as other states, um, but they are not immune from the rise of incarceration. Okay, so in 1990, the state of Washington has 7,995 citizens in prison. So in 2000, 10 years later, what do you think that number is, or was? Well, I guess it's 10. 10? Okay. Any other guesses? 25,000. 25? Okay. 14,915. Double. So, yeah, doubled, and then some, in 10 years. Okay, and uh, 2009, that grew to 18,000. So, you can see how rapidly this rate is going. And crime hasn't decreased, by the way. Just the rate that we're imprisoning all of our citizens has. And I'm going to actually talk about how that affects the individual as well as the community because most people that are incarcerated are only incarcerated for two to four years. They get out. You know, there are neighbors, there are classmates. So what do their lives look like once they get out? Dallas. So let's talk about, you know, the economics of the thing, okay? So just one, one aspect of it, phone calls, okay? So this isn't even talking about the actual amount that it costs to make that phone call. These are the fees and the charges, okay? So the average surcharge for a prison phone call is between four to five dollars. So most companies charge 90 cents per minute. So a 15, phone, 15 minute phone call could cost you about 18 dollars, okay? And true story, uh, I, was, I think it was in Atlanta, and I got a call, and I didn't know what the number was. I didn't answer it. So then they kept calling me back, so I finally answered it. And it was a young lady who mistakenly dialed me from a county jail. And so I told her, um, you have the wrong number. I'm sorry, and I hung up. That 30-second conversation cost me $12. That was all the fees. Um, it cost me $12. I'm like, really? 30 seconds? Now imagine that was your mother, or your father, or your son you know, or a friend, or a loved one, you know, who was gone for two to four, 10, 15 years, how much that will cost you. So the, so the amount that families of incarcerated people spend on phone fees every year, how much do you think that is? Right? Well, I guess. 2000. 2000? For fees every year? Ten, ten, ten something. Oh. Actual cost three hundred and eighty six million dollars oh. oh. on phone fees. Oh. Okay. Not the calls. <laughs> Not the calls, the fees cost that much. Because prison they're outsourcing this. These are outside companies that are overseeing the phone calls um, and are charging. That's just the phone fees. That's good That's not medical. You know, that's not food, that's not clothing, that's not your needs if you're, you know, in prison. That's not family visiting. We're not including gas. Or if you have to fly somewhere because your loved one was sent to another state while they were in prison. This is just phone calls. Yeah. Let's talk about another aspect of this incarceration when women in prison. So the number of women in prison increased by what percentage between 1980 and 2011? So in 20-year period, you know, what percentage do you think that grew? 100%. 100%? Yeah.
Yeah. So women in prison increased from 15,000 in 1980 to over 100,000 by 2011. So they, their rates of imprisonment um, increased at, at nearly 1.5 the rate of men, with more than 1 million women under the supervision of criminal justice system. So that means that they are you know, on uh, probation or parole, including prison and jails. So what do you think that is causing this spike, with, particularly with women? What do you think, particularly with this time period? So you have you know, the war on drugs, and what's happening is, so while they're arresting you know, the low-level drug dealers, they're also arresting the women in their family. You know, so the girlfriend who may be working with him may not know what his business is, but somehow she is benefiting from it. The mother who may be taken care of, or the aunt, or the grandmother. And because these women don't know the details, they get longer sentences sometimes than the actual drug dealer. Because they just can't offer the police any evidence. And so they get charged just as, long, just as much as they do. This is also including women who are victims of domestic violence. You know, and you know, they may kill their spouses or loved ones. None of that is put into consideration when they're sentenced. It doesn't matter. Let's talk about mothers. You know, so 62% of women in state prison have minor children. So we're not even talking about the children of these incarcerated parents that are now in prison. What happens to them? What happens to the babies? One in 25 women in state prisons and one in 33 women in federal prisons are pregnant when admitted to prison. So what happens to a woman when she has to give birth in prison? Mm -hmm. Oh, they take the kid away, but when she has to deliver, they're not being sent to a local hospital. They're actually shackled in their bed to give birth. Yes, that's happening today. So they handcuff their arms and their legs, sometimes their belly, and you have to give birth in that condition. Because some, for some reason, you're at risk of running away while you're in labor. Yes, that's real. So 13 states, including Washington, have prohibited shackling. However, 37 states have no law on it whatsoever. So it's still going on across this country of ours. And while proponents of shackling you know, women while they're in labor said is to discourage them from running away, you know, international, and the UN call it torture. And it's inhumane. I mean, you're in labor. You're not running away. <laughs> So that, yeah, that's, that's real. This is, the, this is the faces, this is what's going on with our system right now. Did you say that Washington State has a law against China? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we're one of the 13. Yeah. So then there are other consequences of what happens once you have that felony conviction on your record. In most states, you lose your right to vote indefinitely. You can never vote, ever. Um, some states are going for a period of time, and a lot of states can get that, that right, that vote back, um, but it is not a simple process whatsoever. And so right now, we have nearly six million people in America who cannot vote. Okay? Um, yeah, some of the states have permanent disenfranchisement. And this originated prior to Reconstruction. So this isn't new. This is an old law. So this is a way to attempt the growth of that black voting bloc and the black electorate, you know. So the prison industrial complex was, was happening long before the war on drugs, all right? And that's still going on today. We saw that in Florida. All these people, millions upon millions of people who cannot vote. So what is a felony? You know, if that's the easiest, you know, that's how your voting rights can be taken away. So what is a felony? And it's a long list of felonies if you are convicted. So not only drug abuse, but vandalism, fraud, forgery, theft, 
uh, of course, violent crimes, um, driving while intoxicated, all of those are felonies. So you can lose your right to vote for any of those, that, but that, that, that. So there's more to that list. So what happens when, once an offender is released? You know, do they, they serve their time, they, you know, they were convicted, they went into the courts, um, you know, they served their time. So what happens after that? They have to pay for a lot of stuff. Um, so newly released prisoners are required to make payments to probation departments, courts, child support enforcement offices, uh, mandatory drug testing, drug treatments, they pay for all of that. They pay fees for all of that. And, oh, there's more. They pay for more stuff. Oh, Wait, the actual prisoners? I can pay yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay, let's see. There we go. Oh, there's more. Um, Pre-conviction fees. So you're arrested. You haven't even been convicted yet. And you still have to come and pay some stuff. So you have to pay fees for jail bookends. Uh, jail per diems are set to cover the cost of pretrial detention, public defender application fees. Um, so yeah, whenever you accept that court-appointed counseling, because you don't have your own lawyer, you have to pay some fees for that. That's not free. Uh, bail investigation fees. When the court determines the likelihood of the accused appearing at trial, you're not even convicted yet. You have to pay these fees. Yeah. Oh, there's more. <laughs> uh, so after you're convicted, um, there is fees for pre-sentence report, uh, public defender recoup recruitment fees, fees for work release program. Work release program is supposed to help you, but you have to pay fees for that. Um, fees for parole and probation. You have to pay for the honor to be put on probation. Um, and then if you fail to pay these fees, your sentence can change. You can be back in jail. Um, they can garnish your, your paycheck. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering if <clears throat> if you are arrested but not convicted, do you still have to pay pre-conviction fees? Yes. You still pay. Yeah. Even if you're not convicted? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, these are just some, these are the fees again some of the costs that comes along with incarcerating and arresting all of these millions of, upon millions of citizens we have today. How much do you think it costs for everyone? They do range. For, for, for example, for probation, um, uh, most states would charge you monthly, so like 50 to $100 a month for probation. But you're on probation for like two years, two to five, two to five years. Um, and then if you have to take a drug test, um, you have to pay for that. Um, so it's, it's a lot of stuff that tends to add up. And they can garnish your paycheck. And some states have authorized that they can take up to 65% of your paycheck. And somehow you're supposed to be on straight and narrow and support yourself and if you have a family and eat and pay rent, as if you can get a job with a record. We haven't talked about that. So, I wanted to talk about the overview. So, the, so there's a lot that goes on with mass incarceration. It's, it's relative, well, not new anymore. It's been going on for about 20 to 30 years. You know, we had this war on drugs, you know, brought on by the president, and now, and then it became in fashion for all of these politicians to be tough on crime. And so whoever can create the, the toughest crime laws for winning elections. You know, so a lot of states adopted the three strikes rule. So after your third um, serious conviction, you face mandatory sentencing, 25 years to life, no matter what that is. And, and in some states like Georgia, it's two strikes. You don't get three, you get two. And you're facing life in prison. And so as a result of that, we have millions upon millions upon millions of people in prison today. And it's taken this long, but finally there are some things that are coming about. Um, recently, President Obama equalized sentencing for crack and cocaine. 
Now that is major because the sentencing disparities was about one to 100. And so you have all of these people who are selling crack cocaine, spending all of these years upon years in, in prison compared to you know, a tea bag size of coke, of powder. And so President Obama has equalized that. Um, and so now they're in court um, deciding if that can be retroactively applied, um, which would be a really, really good, good deal. Um, and Eric Holder is also championing ending um, mandatory sentencing sentences. So for some crimes, if you're convicted, you serve a mandatory sentence, 10, 15 years, without the possibility of parole or probation. So it's a, it's a tough reality that we're living in. And what's sad is the fact that we imprison all of these people, and because they're in jail, nobody cares about them. You know, they're the, they're the criminal. They, they did these crimes, and so we have to lock them up, and then we forget about them. We don't care about the women who are being shackled while they're giving birth. You know, we don't care about the fact that prisons were created for men, and so they're not really fitted for women's and women's needs. You know, the, or the fact that, the, you know, prisoners who work are making, what, 75 cents a dollar an hour for our license plates? And our, you know, in some clothes, perhaps, or some jackets. Um, and that, the idea that, you know, prisoners are working and, you know, manufacturing these goods goes back to Reconstruction, post-slavery, to um, convict leases, leasing system. So you have the end of slavery, and then you have Reconstruction, where you had, you know, African Americans making strides in the economy, um, in politics, you know, U.S. Supreme Court, just, you know, not justices, but um, senators, um, and, then, and then they created all of these new laws that specifically targeted African Americans. And so you enjoy your freedom, and then you get hit with a conviction and fees you can't pay, and so now you're right back into slavery. So this has been going on for a long time, and the system hasn't changed. But now, you know, we're counting the cost. It's actually costing us, and we're paying for this, by the way. These are, you know, our federal and state taxes. We're paying, we're putting this bill. But now states are looking at it and realizing that it's not, you know, it's not effective, cost effective enough. So now we're gonna move and actually try to end this mass imprisonment. So, I had some books that I brought. Um, so one book that I brought was Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman. And so he focuses on mass, pretty much the re-enslavement, he called it neo-slavery, that happens right after World War II up until, no, the Civil, Civil War, excuse me, Reconstruction, until World War II. Okay, so that's a really good, um, really good book, really good resource. And then also, Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow. This book actually made me mad when I read it. <laughs> this is the research that I was doing. Um, so, because she, she goes deep. And she, she paints, you know, the reality of what's going on today. In light of, right after President Obama became president, everybody was talking about this whole racial, you know, utopia land that we're living in. But our prison system and our education system and our, you know, economy paints a very different picture. You know, and so she, she goes there. Um, Angela Davis is another strong advocate against the criminal justice system, and this is one of the books that she wrote, and she directly challenged the idea of even having prison, because it's not serving a purpose. Um, another book, Inner Lives, by Paula C. Johnson. So she interviewed currently and recently released women of color, um, most of them are black, yeah, black women, um, and she gave them voice. So every chapter is dedicated to a woman and her story. Most of these women were in prison for mental illness and um, unhealthy relationships. So imprisonment has become the cure-all to house the unemployed, the mentally ill, the, Ill the illiterate, and the poor. We don't want to fix these issues, we just lock them all up and we didn't, we don't treat them. And so she gives a really good look at that. And then another book I brought, um, The Rich Get Richer and the Poor Gets Prison um, by Jeffrey Greenman. And so he talked about 
um, all of these these lovely crimes that the rich get convicted of and then walk out or don't get convicted of. Like nobody in our banking system has ever been arrested or convicted. Um, but you sell marijuana and it's a problem. <laughs> and so he, he goes into that a lot and talks about the discrepancy of class um, in our prison systems. And so, you know, this, these are the, the realities of what's going on right now. Um, and so some other resources, the Sentencing Project, um, that's online. Um, that's a really, really good resource. They do nothing but research. Um, so they have some really good stuff on there. Um, and there are just a ton upon tons of hundreds of articles just written on the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration. Um, and so there's just a lot of stuff out there. So I wanted to close uh, with the quote from Slavery so by another name. Um, in this brave new world, punishment for the original offense is no longer enough. One's debt to society is never paid. Because once you have a record, it does not go away. Good luck getting a job. Because that's pretty, I mean, because that's the reality of the situation. So I wanted to. That's the last slide. Yeah, so I wanted to open it up to comments and discussion. Um, again, I just glossed over, and I just gave it an overview, so there's plenty to delve into. I was reading the new Jim Crow, and um, one of the issues I thought was really striking was that if a young man or a young woman who's a felon comes back to try to live with a parent or a grandparent, um, that parent or grandparent can lose their housing mm -hmm. because a felon can't be in subsidized housing. Yes. So their families, because they're housing a felon, they could lose their housing. Yes. Yeah, so uh, some other collateral consequences. You can't get subsidized housing. You can't uh, get a student loan to go to school. I actually had a friend who was filling out the FAFSA, and she just wanted to see what would happen if she said yes, that she'd be convicted of a crime, and the rest of the application disappeared. <laughs> like, there was no continue button on the bottom of it. So you can't get loans, student loans to go to college. You can't get any federal aid. Um, and, but, and it's really sad because the majority of the imprisoned are poor. And they're supposed to figure this out. It's really sad. And they, she was also saying that certain jobs could not be had. I haven't gotten far enough to see what those jobs were, but um, that was also disturbing. Mm -hmm. That's good. First, I want to commend you for doing this. I am um, in anything that helps tell the story about the crisis that African Americans are in, especially African Americans who have been here multiple generations. It's really important. And so I just want to commend you for that. And I just wanted to add that uh, sometimes the felony can be resisting arrest. And that is a judgment call of the police officer right there in the field. And that's an instant felony. And it's that a person's word against the police officer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be disobeying a lawful command. And uh, again, that's a judgment call, and it was done right there. And now that you have changed this person's life. The next thing that I want to mention is that um, the fees include uh, child support, because maybe you lost your job because you spent a week in a jail. And now you're struggling to get work again. Or maybe you got detained because you had a marijuana conviction and you're on probation when the next thing happens. And so your child support uh, starts amassing on top of all the fees and everything. And so a lot of times when these people come out, they come out laden with uh, $15,000, dollars $25,000 worth of fees and costs that have to be paid before they get all their rights back. And uh, that happens in the state of Washington. The third point I want to make is that between about 2000 and 2010, 50% of those incarcerated in the state of Washington were incarcerated on minor possession charges. And the lion's share of that 50% <coughs> was incarcerated on 
marijuana possession. Uh, or marijuana possession was the was the underlying thing that got them on probation and then something happened and they were in for violating that probation. And uh, so if you think about it, a lot of this is happening to people who are very nonviolent and and we're criminalizing activity that would really, if we were looking at it scientifically, we be like smoking a cigarette or selling some of the cigarettes. Because marijuana even has medicinal uses. But it has served the purpose of helping to incarcerate, to warehouse away a group of people that the Reverend Dr. Sam Barry McKinney, that down that street is named that number was down, caused the last, the least, the lost, the left out, the locked up, and the locked up. And it's a it's a cry. Even in the state of Washington, the state of Washington has one of the most incarcerated black communities in the whole country. The state of Washington incarcerates blacks that are raped as two times worse than Mississippi. And it's just a crisis. So I just want to commend you and want to thank you for shining a light on this. And I hope that every single person will do something to help people whose voices are not heard well mm -hmm. and who are in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a really, thank you for your, your comment. Um, it's a really deep, deep topic. Whenever I wrote my thesis and it was, you know, published at Georgia State University. I actually had a lady from New York email me. Um, they have been searching for um, a family member. And um, I use, so for my thesis, I use 600 inmate profiles. Because once you're convicted, that's public record. Um, it is not hard to find. And so I use 600 uh, women and I put them their names in the back, you know, in my appendix. Um, and so from New York, she called me. They was looking, she emailed me, they was looking for a family member who was uh, sent to prison and they didn't know where she was. But they found her name uh, in the back of my appendix and so they were able to find what jail she was, where, what prison she was in, in Georgia. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is a deep, a deep uh, issue, for sure. Christina, what do you think about the rise of the privatization yeah, that whole thing. <laughs> um, we can even talk about that. So that's also part of the prison industrial complex. So you have all of these private companies building, you know, prisons that are making millions, billions of dollars off of filling these prisons. Um, so you know, the, the so the government is paying these companies to do this. Um, so this part is. All part of this, you know, this whole entire system that's corrupt and it's problematic. They're making money off of the incarceration. And aren't they charging states? Yes, they are they're charging not, states. They're, they're not filled. Yes, yes. Huh? They charge that. Yeah, they're not filled. Yeah. So the taxpayer would basically have to pay for the burden of the prisons not being filled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I also heard that those prisons are being located in areas where people don't have a lot of employment. So all of a sudden they're getting big employment, and mm -hmm. so the people are supporting it mm -hmm. because they're getting work out of it. Bringing jobs to the state. A lot of these are bringing jobs to the state. Yeah. Please, they are in prison. Is that how? Yeah. A lot of them can. <laughs> um, realistically, a lot of them can. Actually, it was it was interesting. I was watching an episode of Locked Up. Um, I forgot what channel they do that on. And one guy, he was up for parole, and he said, he turned around and went back to his cell. He's like, what's the point? I can't afford to pay all of this. I might as well just go out and serve my time instead of being put on parole. So whenever I leave, I'm not, I'm done with my entire sentence. I'm not on parole anymore. So they have a choice in order for them to leave. They what either, choice is that? Yeah. <laughs> they either serve the time or they have to pay the penalty. Well, that's what he, he decided. I'm not sure what his case was, but that's what, yeah, he decided. Instead of being on parole and paying a monthly fee to be on parole and probation, he just decided to serve his time. He turned right back around and said, yeah. But I think the question, like, if one person goes in the prison and then if he cannot work and then he found, like, chance to work, and then what is going to, like, it sounds like the person is going to do more crimes or just no, Maybe illegal things and teaching people and you know, uh, I mean, in wrong position, like you know, just to make some drugs, uh, activities, 
and then like how else do you know just to teach how to make and then that because you can create just um, you can create that uh, something that to get money okay? because you want to live and then or just they they do another crime to go back to, to the to prison because they prefer to live in the prison than to live outside because it's very um, hard to live outside without war. It's like you cannot move, you cannot go out from the state. Like yeah. if you want to move to Canada or just other countries, you don't know, it's so like, it's very uh, like sadness. I don't know, I can't explain. Yeah. yeah. I'm so sorry about this. Yeah. It's a, so it's difficult. Yeah, it's a, it's a sad situation. Like, especially with the youngest you know? Those, those guys, they, they, they direct, directly, they, they, uh, they start to do something illegal things. That's why the the guns, they're using their own portion or their own uh, activities, and um, they, they, they made groups, and then they became racist, and then like, you know, just started to, uh, to move or to move against someone. Like, it's very bad, it's, it's involving to, to, to we have more crimes and uh, you know fatal things. We don't. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, my brother's gonna get out in a week. He asked to stay in because he didn't want to be on probation anymore. He to serve all his time. The judge refused. Just said until you, until you comply with the terms completely. You want to be under my jurisdiction, and his problem with that is that he'll get out and be trying to take care of the kids. And every once in a while, they pick up a kid from school, they help the wife out. He'll go and drive, but he can't get his license yet. And every once in a while, he'll get caught doing that, and then he's back in the system again, and it extends it some more. He just get fed up. But they wouldn't let him do it. Yeah. You just say it becomes just perpetual. Yeah. So they wouldn't let him stay in jail? They wouldn't let him stay in jail for the whole time that he's in there so that he could do all the time for his fees, for, uh, for his, uh, uh, you know, if they let him out on probation, they let him out on probation with terms. Mm -hmm. He said, I, wanna, I just want to do all my time so I don't have terms. Mm -hmm. And then I give him the choice. Can he appeal that decision to a higher level? Yeah, but I can't. Uh, you know, I'm teaching here. He has no money to get it. Yeah. Yeah, who, who's going to take it? I'd like to <coughs> step back and talk about, we were talking about COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. We actually do have a new COINTELPRO, COINTELPRO 2. And my friend, <coughs> who is a, a former CIA analyst, um, is working for the ACLU now and speaks very well on this. There's some YouTube videos you can watch about it. And a lot of times they will try to get people, set people up to get them into prison. If they're an activist, if they're a writer, if they don't know what they're doing, <coughs> maybe a leader in the black community, maybe a leader in the um, Native American community, they, it's still going on. <laughs> yeah. My colleague, uh, one of my classmates when I was in grad school, her family were talking <coughs> about going to Pro. Um, her mother, they were connected to uh, the Black Panthers, um, doing community work. Okay, her, her father's a musician. Um, and uh, they were talking about the FBI. Her older sister gave birth in prison, in jail. Um, and her, her parents were fed up. I think her dad is still around, uh, in the state, but her mother moved out of the country. She was tired of the U.S. It was, it was completely unfair. Um, and so, yeah, I'm definitely connected to that experience. Um, yeah, it's a hard reality. We're in college here. Is there, are there any education programs to work with people who are incarcerated so that they get out and actually have a skill and, and, and get a job in a field that will hire people that have? Yeah, most states have programs, um, but those are most of them are nonprofit and they're community based. Um, they rely heavily on volunteers. 
Um, but there are some, there are a lot of programs, not a lot, but there are quite a few programs like that in each state, including Washington. But nothing from the community college system. Not that I mean, I don't, I, that I don't know. So New Holly, so me and a bunch of pastors, we went to Eric Pettifer, who represented the 37th District. He brought us back to uh, New Holly, uh, South Seattle Community Colleges program. They made a lot of promises to us about getting jobs for people with felonies and all that. Everything looks so fantastic. But we've got people in the system working through the courses that they told me to take. And now we're at the end of this recession. So this is the time when blacks start getting work, but most whites have already got work. Mm -hmm. We're the last ones. Mm -hmm. we're, we're in the recession, we're the first fire and the last hire. Mm -hmm. And outside of the recession, in long time, we're the last hire and the first fire. And so, and, and those programs are barely giving jobs to, I mean, I, I've got five, six people in. We know of no one that's got a job yet. And I suspect some are getting. So what they'll have is they'll have, the need will be this big, Whatever the states are doing would be like this. Yeah. But they will parade that as if there's opportunity, why are you not getting work? It's obviously because you're lazy, or you just don't have family values, and maybe you like going to jail. And a lot of people are buying them. Yeah, yeah, talking about, yeah, that mindset and buying that, into that, things. Like, think I about mean, it. If you're going to court, right, if you're sitting in a court, you're not thinking that a prosecution is lying or that the police made an error. You know, it's a defendant against the entire system. And so you're, the, the fact that you were even in a courtroom makes you guilty. You know, it's not innocent if you're proven guilty. That is also a lie. <laughs> something in that vein that I just never really thought about like police officers don't aren't required to have any education like they don't take any cultural competency courses like they don't have to self-reflect and like come to terms with their own prejudice and biases they just go to the police academy and then they're cops yeah which is so yeah so you have all these people arrested going through the court system for the judge you know it's a bigger crown for a jury and then the idea that this person is truly innocent isn't there at first no, you're in court. You're, you're guilty of something. You know? Yeah, she was like, when, uh, one witness we had uh, uh, near the, the uh, what do you call the uh, sheriffs, like the, the police department. Mm -hmm. And then we, I was just, uh, I, I, I present my camp, my country, and watching. And then the police say, like, the girl, she didn't do anything, but the police just really suspect her because by the car because you were looking on the person. Mm -hmm. And then when he watched the light and then the, the, the girl she put her car and then she's scared because in her back home police they hit the people and then they stay for the police. Mm -hmm. And then the police he suspect her because she scared him and then he told that she she did some fault. And then he like he gave her scared and then she goes to court like and then after that uh, after they realize it the problem is that they, they, they make the problem to go to follow her a lawyer. Mm -hmm. that she, she, she's great, but you know, as she said, like the police, they don't have lectures about the societies or the communist culture. Mm -hmm. So that's like, it's not the rule of like she got a psychological arsenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that whole idea. I mean, you have an entire community who don't trust the, the police. So, yeah, if I'm pulled over, I might be a little nervous. Not because I'm guilty, because I don't know what you're going to do next. You know? But yeah. that makes you guilty of something. Everyone in police, I was working in the gas station. Because he used to come in the gas station. And we, we, were, we had a small talk. And then one, one day he told me, like, there was a girl. He was a construction, he was working with the first construction. And then he was going to his home and then there was a girl in front of him. And then the girl she started to drive like she drive. <laughs> and then after a while she passed the red light. <laughs> she passed the red light and then after when she when she came to heaven, she stepped on the road. She came on the road. Because he was he was a police and then he he cannot stop her because he's a construction police. And then She's scared of him and she cannot drive. Like, you know, some, some of the people, like, they don't have a, 